So first, we just want to ask, why do we need higher education? Like, what's the point of it? Does anyone have any ideas? So we can get good jobs. Yes, that is what they want. Um, so if we look at the difference between getting a bachelor's degree and getting less than a high school degree, there is a huge earning differential. Um, if you get an advanced degree, there's still a huge differential between there. Um, and so yeah, like getting college education means that you're going to hopefully get a good job and actually have a decent way of life. However, there's a lot more to it than that. Can other people think of other reasons why we need college? Is that spike right there in the purple, the dot-com uh, bubble burst in the economy when all the dot-coms went uh, public and they started taking up all the workers with the high degrees for those companies? Like, there's probably a good chance that's what that is. Um, I don't know for sure uh, when exactly and why that happened, but um, that's not a good, that's not a bad idea. Any other ideas about why we need college? Education helps for participating in democracy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean that's a huge <laughs> one. Without an informed, <laughs> without a informed society, society, you can't really have a good democracy yet. Enlightenment. Here, let's go with that. Oh. Enlightenment. Yeah. Hello, Steven. Uh, higher education should, uh, with higher education uh, comes a lower crime rate. I was about to say now. Yeah. I mean, it's important for allow people to become developed individuals and just, you know, have, you know, study the things they want to study. Uh, it allows people to be multifaceted in terms of sustaining themselves. Yeah. I mean, we don't want to turn out people that just know how to do PowerPoint and know how to, like, put in numbers. Like, we want people. Um, so, you know, education is important for allowing that. You get to learn more about yourself. You get to learn more about your society. So, what we want to talk about is how rising costs are affecting students. So, I know we did this earlier, but how many people here have seen tuition increase during their time in school? Um, yes. How many people here have taken on debt to, uh, to go to school? Yes. Um, how many people have had to work more than one job to go to school? Yes. How many people have had to you know, drop out of school at some point because of costs? Yeah. So, this is a problem. It's, it affects people. Um, you know, people in this room, almost everyone is hit by it somewhere. Around. And so this is something that's really problematic, and that's why we want to deal with it, and we want to make sure that we're able to solve it. And the thing is, we do have solutions, we just need to make sure they happen. Um, so this is going to be really brief, but we wanted to look at how the U.S. used to do college, and how we do now, because there is a shift. Uh, the first way that U.S. used to do college was land-grant universities. So the idea was that we're going to set aside this land for states to develop universities so that they can educate their pockets. The idea being basically so they have job training um, and also you can have more developed jobs. So it wasn't you know, this idea of the individualized, you know, the, the actualized individual, but it was more just like we need smarter people to do more advanced jobs because that's what capital requires, so we created universities. But the idea was that we did want access to them, so we created land-grant universities all across the country so more people could get to them. But, yeah, go, Phil. So. Yeah, like Atlanta A&T or anywhere. Yeah, and after a while there were um, traditional black schools that were part of these land grants as well. Um, then we had the GI Bill, which was the next really big step in terms of how people went to school. So after World War II, uh, the government covered 50 to 80% tuition for veterans and provided wages so they could also just go to school. So if veterans didn't have to get a job, they were able to just spend their time going to school and caring for their family. Um, this wasn't a perfect system. Um, one, it required a massive world war for it to be enacted. And then two, uh, black veterans were largely excluded from the program. They were only able to go to traditional black schools, and there were a uh, lower number of traditional black schools there, so they had fewer opportunities to go to school. So, you know, the, the, the GI Bill was good, but it wasn't exactly, like most of the programs during that time, it wasn't very good on race. Um, so that was one of the problems. But it did educate more of the population. Then the final part is the Great Society during the 60s. So LBD, LBJ and Lyndon Johnson did want to make sure that more people could go to school, so they made sure it was more affordable. So they pushed state governments to increase funds for higher education to make it more affordable. And the rate of college degree attainment was much faster uh, during that era. And, but since then, we've really decided to change that. So the country hasn't increased its funding for higher ed. In fact, it's been declining rapidly. Um, and because of this, we're seeing more people turned away from school. And so now we want to talk about what the current situation is with debt and with higher education. Okay, thanks, Andrew. So this is a pretty startling um, uh, chart. As you can see, it's the cost of college has risen 
uh, I mean, 498%, actually over 498% from 1985 to 2001, which obviously says something pretty troubling about how we feel as a society about higher education. Um, and the question also then comes to, as we all know, who's paying for this? Who's paying for this increase in, in this tuition, right? So this shows, again, soaring college tuition. Then this is, this is also startling when you compare it to, to the median family income. It's not rising. Um, and something I also mentioned, it's based upon uh, Social Security, um, uh, their wage index. In 2010, 50% of Americans earned uh, $27,000 a year. So getting back to the question I asked, how are we paying for this? Who's paying for this? How do we pay for college? Loans. Loans, debt, right? So as Andrew already talked about, there's also been funding cuts too. So this is a saying in response to dramatically decreased federal aid to states, funding um, of higher education dropped from 7.2% of state expenditures in 1977 to 5.3% in 1997, a 27% drop. Um, and then the share of public university budgets provided by the states have dropped from 50% um, in 1979 to 35% in 2000. Um, and then now we have this, this economic downturn, uh, which makes it even harder on these states. And, of course, um, we have in response to this tuition increases, right? Um, on average, states decreased their per student appropriation by 3.2% from 1995 to 2010. And this is, of course, for stu um, students to take out more debt and to, to rely on tuition, so increasing tuition to fill that gap. Um, in 1985, 23% of funding for higher education came from tuition. In 2010, it climbed to 40%. Students obviously now have to pay more, right? And then here we can see um, there are obviously are some states that have that are invested more. But if you look at it, it's North, North Dakota, Texas, Oklahoma. I know for a fact Texas because that's where I live right now. That has to do with um, the oil boom, if you will, the fracking in terms of the um, in terms of energy. So that's probably that the correlation. But as you can see, um, it's more of, of a decline in investment. And then, as we were saying about how we are affording school, as we all know now, um, you can see with this, this graph, what's troubling is that more people are taking out loans versus grants, right? And then this is sort of what's the difference between loans and grants. And who, can, who knows the difference? I know it's up there, but what's the difference between a, a grant and a loan? Grants are basically free money. Right. So it's given to you by the state, or maybe let's say, not a scholarship, but it's for, it's free. You don't have to pay it back versus a loan, right? Which has interest. So this is sort of a description of that. Okay. So that now we're seeing um, these are the issues with Pell Grants, which also the problem with Pell Grants is the maximum is $5,500 a year. And the average cost for state school is, you know, with room and board, twenty thousand dollars. So it's not keeping up with the increase in tuition. So again, this this shows how grant aid. This is another chart showing it's not it's not keeping pace with the increase in tuition. Um, yeah, and then as Trim was saying, you know, the amount that Pell grants actually cover has been declining rapidly. So this is a real problem. Um, even, you know, as fewer people are getting aid, the aid is covering less and less. Um, yeah, so we want to talk about the different types of loans really quickly. First, you have the government guaranteed loans, and these originated by private loan lenders against losses from default and pays a fee to lenders. Uh, these loans are five times more expensive to the federal budget than direct loan programs. Um, so what happens here is that the federal government guarantees these loans. So Bank of America can uh, loan uh, Alex, for example, um, all the money he needs to go to college. And if Alex enters a down economy and can't find a job and pay back his loan, he defaults. But the bank still gets the money because the government has guaranteed the loan. So they still get all the money that they wanted from him without having him to pay the loan. So 
There's no real need for them to renegotiate. There's no real need for them to work with him because they have a guaranteed uh, source of income with this. So this is a real problem because you know, the government gets soaked on the deal, the banks are happy, and the student is in a terrible position. So an example of this is the Federal Family Loan Program. Uh, loans come from the banks. It privately subsidizes student loans originators. There's, a loan, there's no debt forgiveness. It's very high profits. And also restrictions on their operations. And interest rates can go to 8.5%. Um, and that's apparent loaning. And now that's for students. All right. So then this is direct loans that come directly from the government. And they're public loans. And these are, yes. And so the example for this is the federal direct student loans. Where federal government loan to students, low fixed interest rates provide options to defer payment, temporarily based on expected income and a possibility for loan forgiveness after 25 years. So Perkins is a low interest one, need based, and it's 4.5 percent. It allows for deferment. Uh, Stafford is variable interest rates, 4 to 9.5 percent. It's based on subsidization. So these are better loans than the private ones, but at the same time, you still have problems with it. Um, you know, the fact that people are being forced into this sort of indentured servitude with knowing they need to pay this back. Um, but this allows us a little more opportunity to fight back than some of the private ones because, you know, in theory, we, we live in a democracy so we can you know, go after these programs and make sure that we shift the balance back to, love, to grants rather than loans. So then we can look at the cost of the taxpayer. So not only are students getting soaked with this, but taxpayers are as well. So this is the amount, so these are guaranteed loans, and these are direct loans. So as time has gone on, guaranteed loans have increased. And the reason for this is because banks make a much better deal on guaranteed loans than they make on any other ones. Because if they make a, a normal loan to you, and you default, it means they lose the money. If they make a guaranteed loan to you, you default, they still get all the money. Um, so it's a win-win for them, and it means that the amount that we have to spend backing these loans up has increased dramatically. Um, yeah, and so this is a very brief history of how things changed. So Nixon privatized Sally May, which then provided guaranteed loans, and it goes on to make enormous profits on default loans. At this time, guaranteed loans had consumer corrections like the ability to declare bankruptcy. You know, as Victor was saying earlier, it's a recent thing that uh, students couldn't declare bankruptcy based on their loans, for any loan at all. And so there's nothing we can do to change that back, but this was the uh, then in the late 70s, loans became less profitable for lenders because of wider economic factors. So stories were circulated that students were abusing bankruptcy charges, uh, though the actual discharge rate at that time was 1%. So they, during the 70s, there was a similar situation where the economy uh, was tanking a little bit, and people couldn't find jobs. And so students were having a hard time paying back their loans. And what, uh, what the right did at this time was saying that, you know, it's not really, it's not really the economy's fault. It's no one's fault but those students. They entered into this on their own free accord, and they're just shirking their responsibilities. Like they're defaulting because they know they can get away with it. They can declare bankruptcy and walk away scot free, and that's what's going on. They just don't want to pay back. They can pay, they just don't want to pay back. When you know it was a problem with people not having a job and not being able to pay more. But this is the story that they used in order to um, make it so that they were able to get guaranteed uh, default, guaranteed loans, and also able to not let students. Uh, declare bankruptcy. And in the 80s, Reagan's military Keynesianism of uh, tax cuts for high earners and increased military uh, spending really squeezed higher education as well as other social programs. And federal grant aid based aid is cut in 1980 and 1990 and loans become the dominant form of student aid we saw earlier. And then we also have this, uh, which shows where our money is being spent today. So this is all the money we spend on the military. Um, and over here is education. Um, so, as we see, like the, the government has a giant pot of money to pull from. It's just what they decide to put the money towards. They decide to put it toward healthcare. They decide to put it towards education. You know, it's a choice that they have. But they've decided to. They've chose to spend it on military. And so, what we need to do is, as we're talking about education, we need to realize that this goes back to military spending, and also it goes back to allowing people to democratically control what our money is spent. Um, so then student pressure changed in the 90s as well. So direct loans from government expanded in the 1990s in response to student pressure under Clinton. 
It provided a no middleman approach to student loans at a low fixed interest rates and options to defer payment temporarily based on expected income. So this was um, you know, a small win for students, and so it shows that you know, by organizing, by building, we can get things done. But unfortunately, we also had a shift to the private sector going on at the same time. So within a few years of the expansion of the direct student loan program, Sally May lost around half their market share. So suddenly there was a better deal in town, and Sally May was losing customers. Um, and there's nothing capitalism hates more than a free market. So in response to that, the DSL program has been attacked and defunded. Uh, during the latter parts of the 90s and 2000, DSL was largely defunded by former Sally May employees who went to work for the federal government, uh, notably Teresa Shaw. Uh, a few guaranteed loan programs, the Federal Family Loan Program, uh, took control of most of the foreign portfolio and returned to the model of the federal government subsidizing private lending institutions. Sally May was listed by Forbes in 2005 as the second most profitable company in her corporation in the country. So this is a real problem. Like these are, this is the person that kind of, this is the company that kind of runs, you know, student loans, and they're definitely doing it in a way that is exploitative. Um, so during this time, we've had even more deregulation and more punitive measures attached to this as well. Uh, some of these include expanded on policy, on the powers of collection agencies, which most are owned by loan providers, uh, and then the 2005 Bankruptcy Act which doesn't allow students to bankrupt, to declare bankruptcy in any way due to student loans. The exemption from TLA and Fair Debt Collection Act, uh, Property Acts. Um, the ability to garnish Social Security wages and collection rate up to 25% of the original loan at a time. So, yeah, so if you're not paying your student loans, they can just garnish those wages and your Social Security. Um, so this is the growth of Stafford and non-federal loans in constant dollars. So as we see, um, the non-federal and private loans have really been rising this entire time um, due to the fact that deregulation has allowed them to take up more and more markets and the fact that we've deprioritized um, direct loans and so they've been able to take that over. Um, um, one, one thing though about the FEL um, and to credit the Obama administration, the, that, that was the, the, the sort of the middleman of the FEL program that was eliminated by now. However, um, that doesn't mean that the loans are gone, right? They're still on the books. So the three biggest lenders, it's, it's uh, Sally Mae is number one, then Nelnet, and then Fiat. They still have those on the books. But now they're trying to get into other businesses like resume writing and financial advising because even though they've created the mess, suddenly they are the ones that have all the knowledge to help solve it. So they're trying to spread out and figure out ways, of course, to continue making profits, but that that debt is still on their books. Um, and if you go and read about when they try to sell themselves to investors, um, their conference calls, I recommend you do research on these. These are fascinating because they talk very honestly to their, um, to their shareholders. You can see a lot about how they make money off of debt. Um, so where are we at now? We are close to being at one trillion dollars in outstanding student loan debt. That's federal and private. Um, I've written a lot about that number. It's not a nice number because it's a lot of people suffering um, under crushing debt. Um, enrollment at four-year colleges amongst academically qualified, qualified excuse me, low-income students dropped from 54% in 1992 to 40% in 2004. Is anyone depressed by this? It seems overwhelming, but we can solve it especially with you guys, um, especially the younger folks. Uh, defaulting, defaulting on loans, as we've said, I think, I think Victor might have said in, in the conversation, is extremely profitable for lenders. Uh, for example, Sally May saw an over 200% increase in their fees during the first half of the 2000s. So, that, so again, they're making money off of usury. They're making money off of people falling into default, okay? Um, which to me is obviously highly unethical. Um, you can disagree, but that's where I stand. A shift towards 5G9 savings plans, the state and federal investment decreases, appears to benefit only the wealthy, of course, and, and who benefits from an increase in tax deductions. So again, this is a chart, this startling chart, that's showing that now outstanding student loan debt, both federal and private, has surpassed credit card debt, the first time ever, the first time ever. Um, uh, and then this is showing a chart among full-time, full-year dependent undergraduate students with unmet need. Um, 
we were just not we're not keeping up with with, with supporting um, low income students as well. Again, as we just mentioned, defaults are on the rise. Um, of the class of 2005, borrowers who began repayments the year they graduated, one analysis found 25% became delinquent at some point and 15% defaulted. More and more people are falling off the grid, which is troubling to me because it's a lot of the people that I deal with. Uh, the Chronicle of Education puts the default rate on government loans at 20%. And then in 2008, 8.8% of all student loans are in default after two years compared to 6.7% of seven. That was a 31% increase in the default rate in just two years. And um, now, as we know, a lot of students, as, as you said, Jess, um, we go to school to get a job, right? So people are making decisions about what major they should make, they should take um, according to what they think, what kind of jobs they can get, uh, which is problematic on multiple levels, as you guys, I'm sure, understand. So again, here's showing um, default rates, and as you can see, the highest are the for-profits. One of the other problems, too, with the for-profits is that they receive a very large portion of Pell Grants, which needs to be discussed. And the other thing is, just yesterday, a study came out with the National um, Economic Bureau, I'm forgetting the two names, but it's an economist and a public policy person at Georgetown. And they showed at these four profits the ones that have received the Pell Grants, because not all of them do. <coughs> some of them do because they enroll the program as part of education. So some of it's called Title IV. The Title IV schools of the four profits that receive the Pell Grants, their tuition is higher than the schools that do not receive the Pell Grants. So, you know, where's the money going, or is it just an excuse to, you know, jack up the price of tuition because they're, they're receiving those Pell Grants? Uh, further privatization, of course, targets um, students of color, African Americans, and Latinos comprise 28% of undergraduates, but make up nearly half, 46%, of undergraduates in the for profit sector, which I think for profits are quite pernicious. I'm not going to get into the, maybe the teaching and so forth, but the model is just pernicious. Um, students enrolled in for profit schools account for 12% of all students, but 24% of all federal students. So here we are, the student loan bubble, if you will. Many groups are now predicting that student loans will be the next bubble burst. What's funny about this, though, in terms of housing, is that can you walk away from your student loans like you can from a house? No, you can't. Because thanks to Bush in 05, you made private loans impossible to discharge. So you can't say, oh, I don't want this degree. I'm going to go hand it back. Or, oh, I'm just going to let the bank take my brain. You know, it doesn't really work that way. So we're stuck with it. Um, so here is, you know, we've outlined, these are, these are some steps, and, and Victor mentioned this too, but let's, let's restore consumer protection rights, you know, I mean, this is not the, this is not the final solution, but it, it's, it's absurd. Um, you, you, can, you can discharge gambling debt, but you can't discharge student loans, okay? Um, reduce the statute of limitations for borrowing, improve oversight of private collection agencies, this is an issue with the Department of Education. Um, I think that it has a role, but it's much more oriented towards collectors. Their relationship is much more in that way. It's very out of balance, and it's at a cost of students. And then these are sort of moral arguments for reforms, um, you know, investing in students, because as we talked about at the beginning, it's important to have, you know, critically engaged citizens. Um, this argument says that in an economy where four people apply for every one job opening, students are graduating only to compete with one another in this very, very brutal, brutal market. And you guys are, those of you who are students right now, you are entering one of the harshest ever. It's, it's harsh. Um, working together and investing socially. So this is really about uh, coming up with solutions that are based upon you know collective, a collective work at the community level. And then these are some more moral arguments against reforms. Um, or these are the against reforms. Students must find their own way to pay for higher education. It's your problem. You know, it's that pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That we've some. It's, it's like on crack now that idea. Um, you know, if you if you break those rules, it's your fault. Pay the price. This is this very callous attitude that's very pervasive, unfortunately, right now in society that I feel like occupies pushing against in terms of let's get together communally. Let's talk about how we can get along better and take care of one another. This is another example of that. 
Um, but as this is pointing out, this ignores basically neoliberal capitalism. But essentially what they've done is they've privatized higher education. Even the schools that are still, you know, non-profit, they're, they're pushing it into this, um, this it's, they're commodifying it. And, and you guys are being, in my view, victimized by it. But that doesn't mean we can't push back on this. Um, and then the other one is creating conditions of individual instability and competition. That's value, of course. So then you have people who are indebted. How can you be politically engaged? You just want to get a job. You want to be able to pay your debt, hopefully live in an apartment. Um, so it's, it, it, it makes it more and more difficult to sort of be a voice um, in a democratic society. Yeah, and as, as Prince talking about, the whole neoliberal project that was began um, back in the 70s is about making as destabilized and as insecure workforce as we possibly can. You know, if you have loans and that you know you need to work to pay them off, you're not going to get political. Well, if you're a student and you have to take a couple jobs in order to work, like you're not going to have time to do politics. This is to make sure that we view ourselves more and more as individuals as people that enter into contracts, as, and that's the, the whole way our society works, and that you know we don't come together and do things. But then also to limit our ability to actually take place in politics and to you know, stand together and just form some force of change. And so like this is what neoliberalism has really done to this country. And that's why we as socialists really need to push back and say, no, there is another model. There are other options. You know, for a long time in this country, people knew that there were other things around. We didn't have, the neoliberals hadn't really won yet. At this point, though, they kind of have. Um, I mean, the Democrats, the most, will give you a somewhat reformist idea of what needs to happen. But it's still much very based on the idea that you know our society is made up of individuals who enter into contracts, and people need to be unstable. You know, the Democrats aren't out there pushing for you know increased labor rights. They're not out there pushing for free higher education. No one is going to do that but us, and so that's what we need to do. So one of the first things that we want is we want all student debt forgiven. Um, as student, as Krim was talking about, there's some easy, like, simple things we can do to make sure a bubble doesn't happen, which would be great, because if the bubble bursts, uh, we'd have more, we'd probably go into another recession, and who knows what that would look like with student debt? It's never really happened before. Um, I mean, housing was awful, and the dot-com bubble was awful, but student debt is just something that I don't think anyone really knows what would happen. So we, we would be terrible if that happened, but beyond that, we just need to forgive it. Like, it just needs to go away. There's no reason for this to happen anymore, and it just needs to be wiped off the face of the earth. Um, now, saying that, it's a very tough thing to do, and we're not going to win it tomorrow. But it's something that we need to bring up. And um, we need to bring up the way we talk about it as well. Um, you know, I phrased it as forgive student debt, but, you know, as Corinne and I have discussed before, this may not be the best way to say it. Because when we say forgive, it means that we did something wrong. As students, we took on too much debt, and now we need to be forgiven. What really needs to happen is it should, we should talk about it as abolishing student debt. You know, this was something that was put on us. We weren't really given a true choice. We were given a choice of going to school and getting, um, you know, a supposedly good education, getting a good job, or remaining with a high school degree, and as we saw, like, earning a terrible wage. That wasn't a true choice that was placed in front of us, so we took the only option we had. Um, so what it should be is abolish student debt, because we don't need to be forgiven. What needs to happen is we need uh, student debt to just go away. So that's one thing we need to talk about. Um, you know, we can talk about this in different ways. You know, if we want to, if we want to couch it in arguments that people understand, we can talk about how it's important to invest in the future. It will invigorate the economy because students will be able to actually buy things instead of servicing their debt the entire time. And then we'll be able to talk attack the root problem, which is the finance industry. If we abolished all student debt, that would be a, a lot of money that the finance industry lost. And that's generally a good thing that that happens. Because that means they have less power, and then we can start regulating them more. Because they won't have as much money to spend on loans. So the other thing we need to talk about is free higher education. This is the ultimate goal. We as socialists believe that higher education, much like secondary education and primary education, is a right. It's not a privilege that should be denied to people. It's a right that everyone should be able to have access to. Um, the reason we talk about access is not because we believe that we need a better workforce to, you know, compete with the rest of the world because the U.S., you know, is the greatest country in the world and we need to be number one. No, people should have access to free higher education because it's a right as a human. The same with healthcare. The same with, um, you know, being able to vote or speak your mind. These are things that are just rights of people and we need to push that message. 
Um, as I was saying earlier, no one else is going to raise this critique, and no one's going to push it for us unless we do it. Um, you know, the Democrats definitely aren't going to do it, and there'll be even some groups on the left that won't say this. So we need to bring this up, and we need to talk about it as a right, not as a privilege, to push back against the neoliberal idea instead of one. And then this is totally a feasible thing. Most European countries have free higher education. Uh, cost of free higher education in the U.S. would be 15 to 30 billion. Um, you know, we're currently paying 22 billion through the tax code, exemptions and credits. Um, so restoring corporate and income tax to those 50 years ago for households making over 200,000 would generate 384 billion in revenue. So we could pay for higher education just like that. Um, it's very simple to do. We just need to decide to do it. So this is clearly a political choice. Therefore, we're going to have to force the issue. You know, as we've seen throughout the day, our government makes choices. Um, oftentimes, they are not the best choices. So we need to be there to remind them of that and make them make the right choice. So this is the end. Um, we're going to ask for questions. But before we do that, I just want to remind people that we have feedback forms in uh, the packets. And it would be really great for you to fill them out. Um, this is part of the Get Up project that DSA is running called Grassroots Economic Training for Understanding Power. Um, and we're trying to create a training program to teach people about how neoliberalism has won and that there are alternatives. So getting feedback on this so we can refine these PowerPoints and refine these uh, you know, lectures would be amazing. Um, so yeah, with that, let's, let's open up the questions. Is, are those PowerPoints going to be distributed for like YDS? Yes. Um, if YDS people want the PowerPoints, they should come see me afterwards. I'll get a list and we can start handing them out to people. And so you know, you could even use them at a teaching during the week of action. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I want to ask somebody, I'm hoping that some of you will jump in. Um, because Victor Point suggested this idea of defaulting politically. Yeah. And there's a, the Occupy, there's an Occupy student loan that would be some group that's trying to push for that. Um, and I've written about this idea of a gender strike, all inclusive. How do you, th how, how do you see that happening? How could that happen? Yeah. Um, it is a good idea. I, on some level, think that a, that a strike is a good idea, but I don't know if it's the best idea for Occupy because a strike like that has to be like 100% completely and fully just absurdly organized because if it's not, it could ruin a lot of people's lives. So, like, it's you know, if you can get like a million or half a million people to refuse to pay their debt for a month, like, that's like a solid strike. But you know, if you get like thousands or a couple hundred thousand people that like say they're committed and aren't entirely committed, you know, you could basically, or not obviously not you personally, but you know, the lives of whoever those people are who went through with that could be ruined. So on some level, I think that's a good idea, but at the same time, I'm a little worried about how dangerous that is for the participants. And um, we're gonna so Steph Johnson or Steph. Uh, Greg, who was supposed to be on the panel, uh, made it. So we're actually going to hear from her uh, um, a little bit after this. And so she's actually going to be addressing some of those issues as well. So let's go, Yoni. And then you, you. So two things. As far as the strike goes, um, I definitely agree with you. It needs to be tightly organized. Um, there needs to be accountability. You know, people signing their names and having their names out there, you know, publicly even saying I'm willing to do this, and it's only then where, you know, if I see 100,000 names, I myself would be confident to try to something. And then it's just going to mushroom from there. And the other thing is, um, it's also, you have to, um, I mean, mass movement as a national level is really important, but you also have to deal with it on a local by local basis, and so just physically occupying schools, you know. Right. Most shutting down schools, having to walk out. And, but then you have to really be smart about it. You know, what are your demands? Uh, what are your what specific concessions do you want to make? What can't you make? Um, I have a general question about this whole thing. Is like all of this still screams the bigger question about jobs because education is not going to create jobs. And so I think with this, you would have to go into the spectrum of what is a job? Do we need jobs? Yeah, I mean that's that's an important part of it. Um, one of the things that has been pushed a lot, especially by sort of um, some parts of the left, there's like Robert Reich, uh, Chris Clinton's former labor secretary. You know, his big thing was like, okay, well, people are losing their jobs, we just need to retrain them, then they'll get new jobs. But retraining someone doesn't mean a job's going to magically pop up. Um, no, we have to you know decide to invest in that. 
So part of that will be huge, either public investment into creation of jobs or the decision to have a wage that everyone gets. Um, you know, there, there's a really good article in Jacobin uh, recently called The Four Futures, which is written by Peter Frace, who's um, a former YDSer. Um, and he talks about how we kind of have these options uh, coming towards us. We can either go even further down the neoliberal spectrum where everyone is unstable, everyone works at Foxconn, um, everyone works 20 hours a day, or 20 hours a day, like, you know, seven days a week, you know, under terrible conditions. Or we can, you know, begin to realize that jobs are everything. Um, we can have guaranteed wages. We can have health care. Um, you know, we don't have the same sort of scarcity economy that we once did. So there really is possibilities. And in terms of whether we want more jobs, or whether we want guaranteed wages, like, that's an argument that I think is being made right now on the left. And I kind of come down on both sides a lot of times, because I'm, I'm with the guaranteed wage. I think we should all have one. But at the same time, like, I'm also a person that is working, so I, I kind of want a job as well. So, like, I think it's a little bit of both. We would need a mixture. So, but you know, building that is going to be part of changing this consensus. Because yeah, I mean, just getting an education won't give you a job. So, Jimmy, and then uh, do you consider intellectual creativity a form of capital? Because if you like that, that leads to a whole bunch of interesting questions about you not believing that we should abolish all the debt. Like, you could get this. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that it is? Um, myself, I'm really undecided about all that right now. Um, I don't know, and I think that's something you know we'll have to figure out for a while. Because that's what college is. Like, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Like, in some ways, it is. Yeah. College and education is a form of capital. Mm -hmm. Because then you can get lots of interesting questions about intellectual creativity and what's a what's a right and what you can patent. And you can get really nitty gritty with the bureaucratic ideology of having the abolishment of any federal, uh, of any student debt, because then, but if you, if you incorporated that, and I'm about as left as it comes, like I'm just messing around, um, if, 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 then you would have to, all the intellectual creativity, all the ideas, all the books, everything that's manufactured, everything that comes from these universities and colleges would have to be public information. And then you can then you can branch out even farther with further hypotheticals that push it to the extreme. And I'm not saying that obviously what we have now is incredibly we have serious problems, but I don't think that the other... Uh, yeah, I mean, like, getting, getting free higher education doesn't necessarily mean that we would have to make everything public and everything free in that way. Um, you know, I mean, this is something that's, I mean, that's an interesting problem, and it's an interesting idea, um, but it's also something that we really don't have to deal with yet. Like, that would be a great problem to have. Um, you know, once, <laughs> once, we get, once we get free higher education, then it'll be awesome to figure out what's going on there. But right now, like, you know, we're under we're under the we're under this constant pressure of debt, and we're under an idea that people don't want to invest in our future. So I think that's the thing that we need to be focused on. But yeah, that's curious though. Um, Abdul, do you have something? Yeah. So what I see happening here, and I'm not sure if you agree with me or not, it's just like there's, there's this haven that hasn't been overwhelmed by abuse, profiteering, and exploitation. We have the health care that's all all about abuse. We have the war on terror. We have jobs. And it's, about, it's about exploitation. And I see that, you know, in the college campuses, there's lots of room as far as the administration and the shareholders go for people to start profiteering off the students. But that really hasn't happened because there's a sense of integrity on college campuses, allowing conferences on, on their site, you know, free of charge, and allowing people to organize and allowing the free flow of communication without any kind of um, oversight necessary because there's a sense of integrity. And, and I just see it as the student loan investors can see it as an independent group, yeah. as a part of profiteering that's eventual and it's kind of inevitable as everything. Yeah, I mean, kind of exploitation of profiteering. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. Like, college is one of the few sort of outlets that still does have this freedom in some form of democracy. Um, but I mean, we t as Krim and I talked about in one of the earlier workshops about why tuition is rising, you know, corporate, or excuse me, colleges are becoming more and more corporate, and they're beginning to back off that democracy. Uh, you know, they're pushing their workers into more unstable situations, and so that's something we, and that's part of, um, you know, this loan, loan issue. So they see that they can make money off of it, so they're starting to do it. Um, so that's something we'll have, we will have to fight against. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you say you want free education, um, is this for private and public, or just for public? 
I mean, I think a good way to start with it is just saying all public schools should be free. Uh, so all public free higher ed. That's the model that most European systems have. Like they have free public higher education and there are private universities that you can pay for. Um, you know, in the same way that we do, we treat like elementary school or high schools. So if you want to go to a private university, you can do that. Um, but you know, that would, that would be a decision like you would enter into. And that's not go for it. Oh, and just to add to that, um, I've gotten letters from across the globe, and one guy recently wrote me, oh, I was back in the winter from Australia, and uh, he reads my blog, actually, on a regular basis, speaking about these models, and he's, he just said, what you write about and what's going on is just appalling, you know, what, what's happened to higher education in, in the United States. Um, it's, it's very possible. There are, there are alternative models of Sam to make this to make this work. I mean, when we saw the pie chart, and we see where the money is going towards. It's not, it's not going towards education or people. And then going off that a little bit, like having free public higher education while still allowing uh, private universities to charge, you know, that would be allowing social democracy to happen. If we then decide if we get that, we want to take it further and you know, further decimate capitalism, I think that would be really great. It's just like, we'll need to figure out the next model when that time comes. Um, but I mean, I think we could work off that first. Okay, good, Jess? So I go to Ohio University, which I could go on and on about how it's becoming more organized. My question is, like, on our individual campuses, how can we stop the globalization of higher education? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Ohio is looking at some real problems. Uh, right. if governor Kasich, who's the governor of Ohio right now, is looking at privatizing uh, state schools there. Um, the idea is that you can move these state-funded schools into the private sector, which means they're under less regulations. The idea is that they'll be able to charge less. But what they really want to do is take small state schools, um, turn them into basically vocational centers, allow the large state schools that are able to fund themselves on tuition, become a profit-making um, apparatus, and you know just uh, restrict access to higher education. Um, I mean, one of the things I think in Ohio, a big thing is going to be like, educating people about that plan that's coming up. Um, you know, hopefully getting for, uh, getting um, cases out of office, and then also like finding the legislators that are on board with it and attacking them as well. But also like going after your administration in some places because a lot of them are on board. Uh, about like public education, like and then versus private, like I go to a private college, but technically they receive government funding to cover and everything, so they're not really private. Yeah. So it's one of those in between, but like they advertise that they're a private college, but they're not really. So how would that work? I mean, I think there are a lot of things you can do there. Uh, so you know, if tuition's the problem there, uh, you can try to try to work on a tuition freeze. Um, you know, in student debt, like that's something we can work as like a large mass of students. Like we can work on that beyond our college, beyond our campus borders. Um, so I mean, that's another thing that we can, you can get involved in as well. Um, I can't speak exactly what would be the best thing to do in the schools right now, but I think um, either going after tuition freeze or, or figuring out a way to fight back against Sal and May uh, would make sense. But I mean, um, so after Steph talks, we're going to have regional meetings for a little while, and so like there we can find some time to talk about like what's the best thing to do and kind of figure it out. So today we're going to do some brainstorming about what's the best thing to fight back, and then tomorrow we're going to try to get people to do some commitments to what they're going to do during uh, the week of action. Yeah, I have a question about the, um, the debt strikes. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this. Is the proposal to get everyone to not pay their debt for like a limited time? I say like everyone doesn't pay for a month. Or are we talking about a like unilateral like don't pay your debt anymore kind of thing? Because I am a supporter of the debt strike because organized tightly, but I don't think that like everybody not paying for a month to get a million people do it would really be that big of an impact considering that, you know, Sally May would know like, oh well, you know, they're just gonna pay you know, all this stuff back in a month. So I didn't know what the proposal was. Well, I am forgetting because I've I've written articles and I'm in touch with the debt refusal crew of the Occupy. I can't remember what their, their length of time is. You're absolutely right though about the month not not be um, really being something. Um, it varies in terms of when you default on private loans. Federal loans, if I'm correct, it takes at least I think three months because they, you have to become delinquent and then it becomes then it goes into default, right? So I, I think if, if if you're to really envision that working, we're talking about long term, you know, six months to a year or something like that. Um, but but one of the, the ideas of the, the pushing it a little more with at least the language and the rhetoric is saying, why does it have to just be students, right? Why can't we have an all-inclusive debtor strike? I mean, there are people who don't have degrees and they are drowning in medical bills and they have, 
you know, credit card debt. And the thing that I, I think is attractive about that is that's really kind of bringing together students and workers, um, unifying them on this theme of being debtors. You know, and so we're, we're indentured and educated, but they're indentured in different ways. Um, but that, again, and, and I, I forgot to point, point this out, this would have to be done at a high, you would have to be so strategic, massive coordination. But, you know, with Occupy and what we've seen, it, what it's done so far, and the fact that it's changed the language, I mean, the Republicans have to talk about basically the 99%. You know, that's a shift in the fact that now we have politicians talking about, you know, economic inequality here. I mean, this is amazing victory. So you can start envisioning, in the very least, the possibility of talking about another strike, and maybe that can sort of, you know, uh, put the pressure on. That's a good question. I think we have time for one more. Um, I'm just curious because uh, I've heard about like a student debt crisis for months now. Who knows how many online? Um, is it part of the conversation in legislatures, either at the state level or the federal level, like anywhere seriously? Yeah? Not really, and that's one of the problems. Um, there, I mean, we haven't really hit the point where they're they wanted to pay attention to is because we haven't built enough power yet. Um, there are, I mean, I'm sure there, there are a couple people probably out there who know about it and are thinking about it, but it's not wide enough that, that we, it's, it's the dominant conversation. Um, you know, right now, the con Occupy did a really great job of shifting the conversation away from budget cuts towards inequality. Um, and so right now, that's opened up opportunities for the left to talk about the different forms of inequality that we have and the different forms of economic oppression that are going on. So we need to use this opportunity that we're faced with in order to push the idea that now is the time to take action on this. And just to add to that, though, I mean, because I work on the Hill, and like I said, please come with me seriously. Um, you know, when I started that uh, over a year ago, they were not willing to talk about that in those terms because I was pushing that over and over and over again. I can tell you now that they, you know, they're like, yeah, we agree with you. And I'm like, great, okay, you agree, so let's like get to work then solve the problem. So. Within some of those circles that are more sympathetic, they are they are willing to use that language, um, which is which is a plus. Yeah. So with that, um, if everyone can head back down to the auditorium, um, we're going to hear a brief thing from Steph Gray, and then we're going to have a regional meetings, and then we'll have the final thing, and then we'll go party. <laughs>